Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. One of the major political talking points of the past week was the elaborate explanation offered by the national leader of the All Progressive Congress, Ahmed Bola Tinubu, regarding his open support for particular candidates for key positions in the National Assembly. At the same time, the former governor of Lagos State had accused the outgoing senior president, Dr. Bukola Saraki, of using his position to stall the swift running of governance in the past four years an allegation which drew instant response from the accused. Many observers say this is just a subplot to what promises to be quite an interesting exercise. Joining us now to keep track of all that is Dr. Abiodun Adeniyi, a political science lecturer at Bayes University of Abuja and public affairs analyst. Abiodun, welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Thank you very much, the great doc. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be under your epistemic questioning voice. <laughs> Good to see you. Good morning. Well, I mean, uh, you had uh, what I was saying. There is this, uh, you know, uh, exchange of expletives, you know, back and forth attacks between uh, national leader yeah. of the APC, uh, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed, you know, and the leadership of the National Assembly, specifically uh, Senator Ukola Saraki and uh, Honorable Yakubu Dogara, Speaker of the House of Reps. Uh, yes. The key issues are about one, the performance of the uh, of the uh, National Assembly, the Eighth National Assembly, and then the politics of the leadership yeah. of the Ninth National Assembly by June. Uh, what's your take? What yeah. do you think? Yeah, uh, very well. Uh, these are things that uh, we expect to happen, and we expect to see more of these ahead of the National Assembly um, or principal officer's election. You know, it's not an anathema to any political process, really. Um, as you are Bola Ahmed, you know, Bruce Haraki will know, there has always been no love lost between them. There's always tension. There have always been in tangles. There have always been these ding-dong exchanges between them, as particularly in the last four years, you know, after Saraki became senior president against the grain of party advice. So we do not expect uh, them to be at, uh, at some kind of uh, obvious peace, but it is okay because it's just part of uh, the kind of political tension, political compression that you witness in any um, system. It can never degenerate beyond this level. Uh, what it's also telling us is that Okay, they belong to different camps, they have different interest groups, and uh, those interest groups, the, the ultimate goal of those, of the average Nigerian interest group is the raw acquisition of primitive power, you know, and the power in question this time, it's National Assembly power, you know, the National Assembly leadership. Okay, it's, again, it's all right, you know, it's, there's nothing uh, strange about the way they are angling for it, but the tragedy of the situation, in my own opinion, is that, you know, we are only have hearing about uh, ranking senators being preferred, or maybe perhaps somebody is coming. Uh, somebody has been in the assembly for some time. You know, those are the basic things we are hearing. We're not um, assessing. We're not being given the opportunity. Rather, they are not. We are not being exposed to their competence, whether or not they merit it, whether or not they can take us out of the many downsides registered with the national assembly, like irregular budget uh, padding, like allegations of. Uh, sorry, irregular, irregular budget circle, um, allegations of budget padding, and the inability, like I said somewhere else yesterday, the inability of the average National Assembly person, you know, to rise above uh, the picadillos, the predilections of the Nigerian people and make a difference at the level of leadership. Rather, they come in and get sucked in the parks and parkside of office, and at the end of the day, they just leave, they just mark time and leave, leaving the stage for another, another set of people who will come and continue um, the tradition of, um, of, of poor leadership. We know that many of them are accomplished, many of them are you know, successful individuals. They can do better than they are doing. And we, it's, they are welcome to continue to angle for those positions, but they should also um, bear it in mind that in angling for it, they need to, also, they need to be concerned about their vision, their mission, uh, subject matters that inf that uh, that they told the electorate in the first instance, and which probably influenced the electorate, or which probably made the electorate to vote them into office in the first place. Indeed, it is mind-boggling that this whole controversy, the hula balu, is created by the APC itself, who, 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 the party with the majority in the National Assembly. But let me ask you, 
Does the interest and subsequent selection of candidates by the party, you know, translate to a rubber stamp legislature or, like uh, Honorable Dogara put it recently, an adult daycare? You know, is this not much ado about nothing? Uh, well, in any political system, there are different ways in which offices or office holders emerge, you know. Um, in, a, uh, in a regular democracy, for instance, election is key, and I think the other aspect is consensus, you know. And in any of these processes as well, there could be some uh, kind of influence ped peddling or attempt by some people to influence the process, you know, depending on um, the, the, their strength and <coughs> the, the kind of in, in influence they wield. So that's what we see the party, APC, doing with respect to who they want and who they do not want um, to emerge as uh, principal officers of the National Assembly. So, again, it's not really strange. It's happened in the past, but just that um, on, on the f past few occasions where it happened, they failed at it. Uh, this time around, we are still uh, watching. It may happen again if all the pieces in the jigsaw are not right, if they are not well, uh, well in place. You know, it's, it's interesting the way it is playing out. Um, but again, it's um, part of the development of um, our political process. It's part of the evolution of our political process. But, but the meaning that we are, the new meaning we are seeing in all of these is that um, the party comes up with its own idea of who the leaders should be, but the National Assembly feels differently. You know, it has happened on the last two occasions. And like, like I said earlier, it might also happen uh, this, time, uh, around, uh, this time again. So what it means is that perhaps the National Assembly, rightly or wrongly, wants some level of independence, wants some level of um, uh, detachment from uh, the party or from the executive as it were. But it, it's nothing strange because another ball, another game will start after the election itself. So it actually depends on how they play it out. Okay, so now we have the pre-National Assembly election stage. We're going to have the election itself. And of course, we are going to have a post-National Assembly election stage. So it depends on how um, these stages are managed, how the actors, how the stakeholders in the process, you know, um, uh, play uh, their game. But the bottom line, really, the ultimate wish of the average Nigerian citizen, of the populace, is that um, these fellows should be much more concerned about statecraft, about good governance. Okay, not too much of politicking, because we have had so much of it in the last um, 20 years, and it has not taken us anywhere. Well, let me take you back to the uh, altercation between uh, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu and the uh, leadership of the National Assembly. Um, Ashwa Tinubu was actually yes. carrying out an assessment of the 8th National Assembly, and he accused them of uh, obstructing the executive, uh, he also made a point about lack of productivity. And both uh, Saraki and Dogara have yeah. tried to defend uh, the two houses that they lead. Uh, but yeah. what's your own independent opinion? How will you assess the Eighth National Assembly? Yeah, very well, Doc. You know, but uh, first of all, I don't think if uh, the Eighth National Assembly had been outstanding, really, I really doubt if. Um, somebody like Ashiwa Jibola and Metinubu, with the greatest respect to him, uh, will come and salute them for doing a good job because of the tension that exists between him and the National Assembly uh, leadership. This is not to say that he's, he's an unfair person, no, but just to say that because of the tension, you know how politicians uh, play their game, you know, they can be very... Um, sometimes it can be very realistic, sometimes it can be very unrealistic, sometimes uh, they have a way of calling black white and white black, you know. And I don't also think that no matter how good, no matter how objective Ashwaju is, I also doubt that the leadership of the National Assembly as it presently is will come out and commend him, you know. Um, because of the tension, the compression between the two of them, they are not likely to see their good sides. Most of them, um, most uh, reasonably, you know, they will focus more on the negative, you know, and it's the nature of uh, the average Nigerian politicians when they don't belong to the same camp, you know. So um, I wouldn't want to rely on the assessments of each other, you know, but if you ask me for my own assessment of the Eighth National Assembly, I would just say that uh, I didn't see any market difference from what uh, we've seen since 1999, you know, and I was privileged as a correspondent of the Guardian to cover the Senate in the first, in the fourth um, National Assembly, you know, so and uh, I made a lot of meaning from 
um, their, their traits, you know, their, their characteristics. And uh, it has continued up to now, you know. Um, at the end of the day, most of the time when they get to that place, I don't know what happens. I don't know whether the problem is systemic. I don't know whether it is an impersonal thing. But they just lost it and they, they get sucked in in the parks and park sites of office and they forget that they forget ordinarily their mission, their visions, what took them there in the first in the first place. Even those of them who are good, those of them who want to make a difference, are overwhelmed by the problematic majority. And at the end of the day, you just see um, us marking another time. After four years, you see another set just come and continue the inadequate, the disappointing and the depressing uh, leadership that they most times offer. You know, uh, the, the encouragement we need to give to the coming one is that, uh, look, you know, it's okay to exist in the, in, the, in the population of the National Assembly as it were, you know, because it's a kind of mini, uh, mini crowd, you know, it's okay to think that you can find safety in that mini crowd. But again, you can also make a difference. You can also be distinctive by um, the way you, um, you, you, you perform, because the populace will see through attempts by the majority to overwhelm you or to bruise and badger you, you know, but to hide under the safety of the majority and prevent yourself from being, from achieving distinction in the place is really unfortunate and it's not really good if anyone, any, politi any politician for that matter, wants to leave a legacy as a leader. But if I may add a footnote, the uh, Senate President Bukola Saraki has said that, look, the uh, Senate, particularly under his watch, has passed about... Uh, 292 bills, uh, and that's about a hundred more than the extant record by the Fifth National Assembly. So, will you, in terms of performance, will you yes. say, you know, I mean, they haven't done well since they, they seem to have so many bills that they have passed? Um, well, uh, they have done well to the extent that I will give them 40 over 100, you know, so that's still a pass, even if it's a marginal pass. You know, but to talk about the number of bills, is it really a uh, doc, you know, as much as I do, sir, that it's not really about um, number, but it's about quality, you know. And it is very easy for any legislator to come out and say, I have uh, a, a passed so, so and so and so number of bills. It's very easy. Quantity is very easy. But what about the quality of those bills, you know? Have, the, have we really interrogated them? Have we really subjected them to a critical analy analysis or evaluation? You know, and beyond that, really, we, are not, we don't lack laws. If you want to look at it critically, sir, we don't lack laws in this country. What we lack is actually implementation. You know, and we don't have the political will to implement most of our laws, and it's actually the bane of our development. It is why, why our society can be described as um, a relatively sick one, because uh, our laws are there, you know, but we look away from it, and if we're not looking away, um, the, the influential ones ride roughshod over those laws, and we're, we're just there lacking and looking and um, lukewarm um, towards them. And, of course, our leaders are also aware of these things, you know. But if... Um, the, the laws we have, if they are well implemented, conscientiously implemented, of course we know we'll be a better uh, society. So it's not about churning our laws, it's about, first of all, the quality and the burden about how well are we going to implement them. You know, if the problem is the agencies that are saddled with the responsibility of implement, implementation, if the problem with them, why don't we take a critical look, why don't we examine them, why don't we improve uh, their, their, their performance ability, their potentials for uh, performance, or their ability to perform, rather. You know, why don't we work on improving them, instead of uh, our concern or uh, mouthing or bragging about um, performing, I mean, about churning out um, a thousand laws. But the inability to implement laws is not the uh, job description of the National Assembly. So w you would not fault them for that. They make the laws, and that's what they're there to do. But let me also bring up one of the issues raised in this uh, current face-off between Senator Bola Tinubu and the leadership. Uh, it's the issue of 2023 presidency, which he has debunked. But in the heart of this is Honorable Femi Gbaja Biamila, who is seen as a stooge. Uh, to Senator Bola Tinubu. And I want to look at the person of Femi Gbaje Biamila. Looking at his credentials, uh, why would you think that anybody would be against the candidacy of Gbaje Biamila for speakership? Uh, his ranking senator, his experience, and of course, you know, he lost, uh, yes, <laughs> and he lost just by eight votes to Yakubu Dogara in 2015. Why do you think anybody would be against the speakership of uh, Femi Gbaje Biamila? 
yes, Adesua, I think it's just a, a revelation of the typical characteristics of politics and political processes. You know, they are very fluid, they are very unpredictable. Uh, it is difficult to mathematize it. It is difficult to place your hand on many things. And it, it, sometimes you can even attribute it to mystery. You know, um, many things before they will understand it. But again, you, you, just, you just have to see the process as it is. It can, it's shifty, um, it's, it's unpredictable, and it's nebulous as well. And that's what we're seeing playing out. You know, yeah, you can talk about Bajabila, Bajabia Mila being um, a competent person, being somebody who is uh, qualitative, presentable, who speaks well, um, very eloquent, and that's the kind of person you want as a leader. But that's not to say that he doesn't have his own downsides. You know, the other day, I, I mentioned it as well, he was reported as having bought a 100 million dollar car for, for his wife. Not a problem, really. If it's his money, fine, that's all right. He can use the money the way he wants. But again, you are a political leader, and you, are, exist, you reign in an atmosphere of mass poverty, you know, and you are luxuriating, you are um, splashing wealth in that circumstance, you know. Uh, that would rather be seen by some people as unbecoming of a leader who want to hold in high esteem. You know, so on his own, he merits it, no doubt. Yes, we have said he has his own downside as well. That's fine. And it's also understandable if um, somebody uh, called Bola Tinubu, with every due respect, is supporting him. That's um, acceptable in any political process. It's, it's part of influence. Um, uh, it's part of deploying one's influence to achieve one's goal in the political environment. You know, and you cannot undermine the factor of Bola Tinubu as well, because, of course, we know that he has a huge uh, war chest, very influ influential. Over the years, he has groomed a crop of, leader, uh, a crop of, crop of, crop of leaders you know, and it's continuing on that front. You know, we, these things are really difficult to fault, you know. But the question that has been raised by the critical minds is that, okay, why will the vice president come from the Southwest? And again, you want to have a speaker from the Southwest. Arguments have also been raised that it's about who, who is uh, more ranking than the other in the National Assembly, you know. And it is left for other interest groups, for instance, regional interest groups like the Southeast, the, um, the Southeast, the South South, and in North Central to push their case, which is uh, highly justified as well. And if they want to be considered for those kind of positions, there's nothing wrong with it because uh, we, need, we are in a democracy. With democracy is about involvement, it's about participation, and every section needs um, to be given that sense of participation so that they will not be, they will not feel um, left out. You know, but as as it is, you know, it is still to be seen how it will play out. You know, but if you ask me, really. I do not see Baja not winning that election, you know, because uh, the opposition, those who are opposed to him, are still um, in some kind of uh, disarray. Uh, they need to pull their ass together because their positions are also very uh, justifi highly justifiable. They need to put their ass together if uh, they want to pose a major challenge to, his, to, to him and the influence of those who are backing him. Well, uh... Maybe uh, I should just make a comment on a light note about your concern that uh, Bajavia Miller bought uh, an expensive car for his wife. I'm, I'm sure you are aware that uh, some other Nigerian big men even buy uh, private jets for their girlfriends. Would you have preferred Bajavia Miller to buy uh, a second-hand uh, vehicle, <laughs> you know, on the occasion of his wife's birthday? Yeah. But anyway, that's on a light note. Now, oh, let yeah, me ask you. Yeah. <laughs> the newspapers are reporting yeah. this morning that... Uh, you know, uh, the number of election petitions uh, is now about 766, and that 77 tribunals will start sitting very soon. 766 petitions, 77 yeah. tribunals. Uh, do you think this is really a very good thing uh, for our democratic process, or a comment on the quality of the uh, 2019 general elections in the country? Um, uh, Doc, I, I, I think the answer is definitely no. It's very unfortunate. <laughs> it's very regrettable that, you know, we still see politics for what it is. We are still die-hearted about political contestation. We're here to come to terms with the philosophy of political contestation, which is um, either you win or lose. And if you win today, you might lose tomorrow. And if you lose today, you might win tomorrow. We have seen it happening even in this uh, 2019 general elections, you know. 
we lack that understanding. And I don't know why we do, why we do really, because perhaps because we are operating the presidential uh, democracy, which is very primitive, you know, because um, in the bastion of democracy itself in the United States of America, they are kind, the kind of presidential democracy which we try to copy is not, it's not as primitive as our own. They are much more civilized, but ours is primitive because um, we, you know, the winner is supposed to take all, but in getting the winner take all, they are hardly uh, magnanimous, they are hardly glorious in victory, and of course the losers too are hardly gallant in defeat. And that's why nobody wants to be on the losing side, everybody wants to win. So uh, no matter what thread you think you can hold on in losing, you still hold on to it, you still clutch onto it, and you still keep pushing, hoping that you'll win. This is very unfortunate, and that's why we're saying that perhaps we can be ingenious about how we can be much more creative about our own, de about our own democratic experiment, rather than aping and markedly idealizing uh, the American type, you know. Um, do we uh, find a way of, um, I I of evolving of, or introducing proportional representation? How do we ac accommodate the loser so that he, he will not uh, feel too bad as if uh, he has lost the whole world in losing election? You know, do we, do we uh, cut down on the number of representations that we will have at the legislature, even in, at the political stages? You know, do we cut down the power of the president such that he will not be that powerful and such that the loser will not feel that he's losing all? Do we cut down the power of the governor as well? Then what about the perks and, and percocide that political officeholders get that make those who are losing feel that they are losing um, their lives in losing election? You know, perhaps we need to um, engage in some of this conversation so that we we'll begin to reduce um, our resource to um, the judicial process. Because we also think, yes, at the end of the day, some of them might even become uh, victorious. But because victories have been recorded through the judiciary in the past, they will continue to be encouraged to, to go to uh, the judiciary, you know, to go to the tribunals. And that's why Fabi Fabi Fala was called the other day the tribunalization of the process. Is, is there a legitimate right? It's okay to go, th it's provided for in the Constitution, it's provided for in all the, in, in, in the, in the, in the electoral process, it's a post-election state, it is legitimate, it is rightful, but the question is for how long are we going to be um, challenging um, uh, declared election uh, results. And we have made the point several as well that, you know, Al Gore had many reasons to challenge the election of George Bush Jr. in the United States in the, 2000, in the year 2000 or so. But of course, he prioritized the privilege of the American spirit, patriotic nationalistic person, and he saw the American spirit higher than his own personal ambition. Hillary Clinton could as well have challenged Donald Trump in a, a few years ago as well, but of course she didn't. Look at everything. Against all permutations, she lost her election, but she came out and congratulated Donald Trump because she privileged, she prioritized the American spirit. You know, how, why are we running away from this kind of um, understanding? You know, why are we um, denying ourselves or why are we not imbibing this culture? You know, yes, we say we are copying the American presidential system, but in terms of attitude, in terms of values, in terms of virtues, we are far away from it. And that's why I, I came up with that suggestion that perhaps we, shall, we should be much more ingenious, we should be much more creative about our own democratic practice so that it can reflect our culture and it can re reflect some of the um, contemporary things that we are learning as we are implementing uh, the one we are implementing even primitively. Uh, at the end of the day, if we begin to uh, factor these this things in, then we might begin to think less of uh, contestation about uh, tribunalizing the process, as it were. Well, uh, you know, by way of wrap up, Earlier on, you talked about statecraft, the need for the uh, senators elect, yeah. the uh, uh, legislators elect in the House of Reps to focus in the Ninth National Assembly on statecraft. And indeed, uh, recently, uh, there was uh, an orientation program and induction course for about two weeks yeah. uh, for these uh, uh, lawmakers elect. Now, what kind of legislative agenda will you set for this night? Uh, National Assembly, what would you like to see, not just in terms of the passing of bills, but also in terms of conduct, in terms of, you know, executive, legislative uh, relations, and in terms of how they focus on what you referred to earlier as statecraft. Yeah, uh, uh, very well, Doc. Uh, I, I think we need a legislature that will uh, be concerned about uh, 
performing the actual role, the natural role of the, of the assembly, which is the expansion of, of thoughts around policies and policy and proposals from the executive and from any other stakeholder and from even private member bills as well. You know, they give us a better understanding of what such proposals are. They are much more focused, you know, they are much more uh, creative and they are much more uh, concerned about making um, our laws original. We need not necessarily a rubber and stamp legislature, but we need a legislature that will see proposals from government and review it critically, not expecting to be gratified in the back door, not expecting some kind of covert gratification, um, some kind of um, undercover, uh, you know, greasing of hands as, is, as we sometimes hear in circles. You know, so we need a legislature that will be um, concerned about, that will recognize that we are still far behind at the level of infrastructure, infrastructures, at the level of utilities, at the level of facilities, health facilities, educational facilities. Yes, we may say that, like this where I alluded to earlier, that um, some of these things are not their responsibility, but they are also leaders, you know, and the average responsibility of a leader is to be concerned about the others, you know. So they, they have influence as well. They can rein in on the executive arm of government because they perform oversight function. They can ensure that uh, laws, legislation, or bills legislated or bills passed are well implemented, you know, because every society is hinged on laws and the proper implementation of those laws. And they, and they have they have been privileged to be elected into positions where they are going to make laws, you know, for the good governance of the society. Okay, so yes, they will come up with these laws. They come up with private member bills like they have been doing in the past. The executive will come up with their own bills as well. You know, but it is important that they are conscientious about the, um, the, the about the processing of these bills. You know, it's they, they shouldn't just uh, think that you know uh, decisions will have to be influenced through a commodification process. Uh, that is the perception out there against them, and the next one should be conscious of this, and they should try to avoid it um, as it were. We do not expect them to um, uh, come again and continue with the regular budget cycle. Um, it, it's, it's actually unfortunate, it is obscene, and most of the time when you look at it, it is very disgusting because you doubt actually if uh, we are, have a budget. You know, it's, most of the time it's just a paperwork, and you doubt if actually they are implemented given the time that uh, they are passed, you know. Uh, by June, most of the time June, July, budget, budget for a particular year is being passed. Where is the time for implementation? Where is the time for you to start preparing for another one? You know, where is the time for assessing whether you have done the previous one well or not? So it's just, it's just a huge joke, and we need this joke to stop, really. Um, the next National Assembly are in a good position to help us, and they should not shack this responsibility. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Biodun Adeneye. Yes, we don't expect that the Night National Assembly will be a joke. Mm -hmm. We expect that it will be a, an assembly of a serious-minded people, I mean Nigerians. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to have you on the morning show.